Thank you, Kat. The Gulf oil tragedy calls us, energy experts, Alaskans, Americans, and human beings to run the world on renewables. Nothing less than that should be our objective and our goal. In order to do that, we're going to need the vast renewable resources of Alaska. And we're probably not going to be able to bring them to these distant markets on electric transmission lines along the usual distribution routes. And so there's probably a better way of doing it, and we're going to talk about that. One better way might be hydrogen pipelines. My colleague Ohashi-san from Nippon Steel says, let's make hydrogen and ship it all the way to Asia. Or liquid ammonia fuel we'll talk about today is perhaps a way we can get these large stranded renewables to distant markets. Ammonia, NH3, no carbon. It's the other hydrogen because most of the energy content is these three hydrogen atoms. And this is the way it combusts, ammonia plus oxygen, if we're using it in an internal combustion engine or a combustion turbine, results in nitrogen back into the atmosphere where it came from in water vapor, no carbon. It's both a fertilizer and a fuel, although it's almost entirely used as a fertilizer. We could have an energy cycle that's inherently pollution-free. Maybe we could have it cost competitive with hydrocarbon fuels. We don't know that yet. It's carbon-free, it burns cleanly, it's a hydrogen carrier. It's easily cracked, the NH3 molecule, to provide pure hydrogen if we need that, say, for fuel cell vehicles. Reasonably high energy density, about half that of gasoline or diesel, so you need twice as big a tank in your car, for example, to get the same mileage. And we have decades of global use. Experience with the infrastructure, we're practical to handle and store. We can use it in internal combustion engines, turbines, and fuel cells. It's a hazard, so are all forms of energy. Electricity will kill you, and so will gasoline. Subject to safety regulations. Feature, self-odorizing. You know when there's an ammonia leak. Very high energy density relative to hydrogen, one of the attractive zero carbon fuels. These inexpensive steel tanks hold a little more hydrogen energy content than this very expensive tube trailer with very high pressure hydrogen. This is 125 PSI. Ammonia has been used as a fuel since at least 1871. This is an ammonia fuel streetcar in New Orleans. Norway pioneered making ammonia from off-peak surplus zero-value hydropower via electrolysis, and so they ran a vehicle on it too. Couldn't get gasoline in Belgium in 43, so they made their own out of wood or coal. The X-15, this rocket fuel, liquid oxygen and ammonia. University of Michigan sponsored this truck that drove from Detroit to San Francisco. It idled on gasoline, and then at full power, it was 80% ammonia. Here's an engine made by a little company in north, northwest Iowa, turning an irrigation pump on a long-term test in Central Valley, California, running on 75% ammonia, 25% propane. You need a high flame spread fuel mixed in with your ammonia, which has a very low flame spread. So the same company said, we'll just crack the ammonia right on board the vehicle with heat from the cooling of the engine, make our own hydrogen, stick it right into the intake manifold, and we'll run that engine on pure ammonia. No propane tank needed there. The internal combustion engine runs very efficiently, either the diesel or the spark ignited engine. NOx is about a fourth that that you would get out of a comparable gasoline engine. Combustion turbines, gas turbines will run on, on ammonia fuel and direct ammonia fuel cells. It's like the solid oxide fuel cell running backwards for combined heat and power. So if we had an ammonia pipe coming into this building, it would be making our heat and our power for us. And no NOx emissions from a fuel cell. Easy to crack to liberate the hydrogen if you need that. Ammonia and hydrogen are the only carbon-free fuels. No carbon in the molecule to worry about. Carbon-free, carbon-free energy cycle, it's the second most traded industrial chemical in the world. Only sulfuric acid has a higher volume. But 95% of it is made from stranded natural gas at a very low price, a dollar a million BTU, typically. These big ammonia plants pay for stranded gas in Trinidad and other parts of the world. And the rest, the other 5%, is made from coal gasification. You make hydrogen, and then the Haber-Bosch synthesis process is the way all ammonia is made today. It's a liquid at only 125 PSI, half the energy density of gasoline, low flammability, flame spread. It's not dangerous. It's not flammable. 
These are the several forms of ammonia fertilizer. You know that the urea plant by Agrium was close by running on cheap natural gas when it was from Cook Inlet. Oh, the only fuel form is called anhydrous, pure NH3. And we have decades of, of safe infrastructure use. We use 14 million tons per year in this country, mostly as fertilizer. It is an inhalation hazard, it's toxic to aquatic life, and it's regulated by these two folks. Energy storage density, as we think of it, primarily electricity energy storage, ammonia and hydrogen are off the charts in any measure of cost or capacity, volumetric or, or weight. The world runs on firm energy. We want the lights to go on. We want safe operation. That should mean every hour of every day I have energy available to me. And that's why storage is important and low cost storage, seasonal scale storage, so that we can run our villages on renewable energy. Ideally, the utility companies would like to have dispatchable energy. They can turn it on whenever they want. They've got a coal pile or a pressurized natural gas line coming into their generating plant. Firm energy is worth more. The market will pay more for it. And it makes bankable these large renewables projects, which are now often not bankable because it's not firm energy, in addition to the transmission problem. And it allows us to avoid many risks from climate change to death. Business is about cash and about cash flow, and this is a business conference. That means we want to maximize our cash in, minimize our cash out, and then we measure these cash flows by various ways, net cash flow, internal rate of return, net present value. The enterprises in question here are the state of Alaska, the communities of Alaska, the people of Alaska, we all have slightly different interests and worldviews, and then the capital investors who are going to make this infrastructure happen, make the renewable energy harvesting equipment and the transmission and storage equipment. There are two business cases to be made for ammonia as a fuel, green ammonia made from renewable source energy. One is export, where the state can increase its cash in by selling, monetizing this major new renewable resource. That would be shipping shiploads of liquid ammonia to world markets. Or increase the energy independence of our villages and communities by reducing their cash out, the money that they spend for diesel fuel, for example. This would mean they would have to run on indigenous renewable resources very close to the village or community. And many of those have seasonal and diurnal variability, so they're not firm energy. We can convert that to anhydrous ammonia, store it in very inexpensive steel tanks, and then deliver it, recover it, regenerate it as firm energy. We can expect that the demand for nitrogen fertilizer, ammonia, and its derivatives to increase because it's essential for the world food supply. Someone has calculated that 40% of humanity is alive today because Haber and Bosch figured out how to synthesize ammonia back in 1909 allowing us to make enough food so that 40% of us can be alive today. The price is very volatile. Here we have 08 and 07. Look what happened at this point in time in 08. Natural gas prices determine ammonia prices to a great extent. And here in 2010, the, the wholesale price at the New Orleans terminal where we import most of our ammonia is now a little over $400 a ton. Here's the price spread. New Orleans, where it's imported, 60% of our ammonia now is imported, 425. By the time you pipeline it up into the Corn Belt, here's the price, and the Corn Belt farmer at retail pays this for it. 95% of global ammonia is made in synthesis plants like this from natural gas. The capacity of these plants between 1 and 3,000 tons per day using the Haber Bosch process. Here's Haber. Here's a Haber-Bosch reactor. This is an antique from a plant in 1921 in Germany. But Germans were able to operate in World War I making explosives from ammonia made from coal gasification. Here's how it works. Natural gas and water vapor come in. Steam methane reforming strips the hydrogen off the methane molecule, CH4. Goes over here to the Haber-Bosch reactor. Here's atmospheric nitrogen made from an air separation unit. Out comes ammonia. Look what goes in the sewer, the carbon atom, as CO2. Here's the competition. This plant 
went in service in 06. It's in Western Australia. Its capacity is 760,000 metric tons a year of ammonia. That's about comparable to the amount of ammonia we could make with a 2,000 megawatt wind plant operating in a windy place. They store it in these refrigerated tanks until they send it down to the wharf to be loaded onto refrigerated tankers and exported to world markets. The tankers vary in size. It comes to the New Orleans, Louisiana terminal in the case of imports where the pipeline system all the way through the Corn Belt because it's primarily nitrogen fertilizer exists and then on the Mississippi gets stored in these large refrigerated tanks. 11 months of the year and one month of the year the Iowa corn farmers come in and suck those tanks dry and put it on the field to grow corn from which we make corn ethanol so that you can have the impression that you're driving clean and green when you put E85 in your car but really the energy came from the ammonia from Western Australia where the CO2 went into the atmosphere so corn ethanol is essentially recycling natural gas when the CO2 went into the atmosphere someplace else. We have over 3,000 miles of ammonia pipelines in this country. They operate at 250 PSI, smaller diameter than natural gas or hydrogen pipelines because they're liquid. And we have 4.5 million metric tons of storage in these large refrigerated tanks, all of it made from cheap steel. There's no corrosion or hydrogen embrittlement problem with ammonia. Globally, 140 million tons a year. It's the number two chemical. It takes about 200 plants like this one around the world to make that much ammonia. That's the equivalent in energy of about 500 million barrels of oil, which is about 2% of the total amount of oil that we use in the world, and about half a percent of all the world's energy. The U.S. uses 14 million tons, about 60% imported, and about half of that for making corn ethanol. This is what it cost them at that plant in Western Australia to make ammonia from natural gas. That plant cost 650 million in capital. Let's assign a 15% capital recovery factor to see what role that plays in the total cost per ton. It takes 34 million BTUs of natural gas to make a metric ton of ammonia. Natural gas, they have a long-term contract, $1.20 a million BTU. Tanker shipping to New Orleans Terminal, for example, is about $50 a ton. And they emit about 1.8 tons of CO2 per ton of ammonia. In the absence of any carbon tax, capital, gas cost, shipping, little maintenance for the plant, less than $200 a ton. At the NOLA Terminal, at New Orleans Terminal, if there were a $50 a ton CO2 tax, there's the tax, it would go up to almost $300. If $100 a ton tax, it's almost $400 a ton. Can renewable ammonia from Alaska compete? This is our first business case. Can we increase cash in to the state of Alaska and its people by selling green ammonia from our vast renewable resources? What would the carbon tax need to be? And what would the global natural gas price be? Remember that bump we saw when natural gas prices were high? The world ammonia price was high. Here's what our renewable plant would look like. Here are the wind generators, or they could be any other form of renewables. We're gonna split the water molecule and the electrolyzer, make hydrogen, nitrogen from our air separation plant. We make ammonia, we store it in a big tank. We either ship it to our community, if this is a village scale system, or we put it on those big tankers and send it around the world for sale. In Northwest Iowa, they didn't need to connect these two and a half megawatt clipper wind generators to the grid at all at great cost if they had used all of their electric output to make ammonia that the farmer on the same ground was going to use that spring on his field or he could have used it for tractor fuel in suitably modified engines. These are electrolyzers. Remember Norway was the first to use surplus hydropower to synthesize ammonia. If we made our ammonia now from renewable source electricity, not natural gas, by the Haber-Bosch synthesis process using those electrolyzers we just saw, nitrogen from the air, no carbon, no carbon in the system. Even better, what if we could integrate these two, replace them with something called solid state ammonia synthesis, which exists only as a laboratory curiosity at this point, but it does work. In this case, electricity and water Electricity from our wind plant or our geothermal plant and air, nitrogen, we make ammonia, 
and we only have an oxygen byproduct, no carbon. This is what a reactor would look like. It's made of a lot of ceramic tubes, much like a solid oxide fuel cell. A small company has invented this process and has a patent on it, NH3 LLC. Why would we be interested in solid state ammonia synthesis? Because the electrolysis plus Haber-Bosch process is too costly. Too many pieces of capital equipment operating at a low capacity factor, too many energy conversions. Results in $1,100 a ton, not competitive with $400 a ton from the Western Australia plant, even with carbon taxes. So we want to make it from renewable energy electricity. Now we have available proton conducting ceramics. That's the key to the technology of solid state ammonia synthesis, very much like the solid oxide fuel cells. Because we need transmission for these stranded renewables, we need perhaps ammonia transmission, and we need a medium that we can store inexpensively, like ammonia. So here's the goals of the R&D project that's necessary to move this from a laboratory curiosity to something that may be useful to Alaska and the rest of the world. We want to compete with natural gas source ammonia because we know it puts CO2 in the atmosphere and we want indigenous renewable sources or we want to be able to export our renewable sources. So this combines electricity, water, and nitrogen to make ammonia and about 50% lower capital cost. We think we haven't built a pilot plant yet, so we don't really know. Haber-Bosch per megawatt of electric power input would cost about a million and a half and make two tons a day. We think, the inventors think, that solid state ammonia synthesis would cost about half that and make considerably more product per day, so more economical. Now, let's imagine applying this to a large wind plant Offshore wind, say ADAG out in the Aleutians, we know that's one of the windiest places in the world. Surrounded by lots of places where we can put wind machines of one kind or another. Here's what such a plant would cost. Optimistically, 2,000 megawatts is large enough to achieve economies of scale. $2,500 a kilowatt, 45% capacity factor for a windy place. That'll make almost 8 million megawatt hours a year. If we made our ammonia by electrolysis plus Haber-Bosch, we need 12 megawatt hours per ton, costs us about $200. No, we make more of it. We make more with solid state ammonia synthesis, and so if we're selling it at $300 a ton at our plant gate in, in ADAC, we're earning 315 million in sales rather than about 200 million in sales made by the more primitive method. But that's only a 6% simple return on investment probably not a bankable project. Of course, then we'd put it in these refrigerated tankers and export it. Let's look at the cost per ton by making it from electrolysis, Haber-Bosch, or solid state ammonia synthesis. Here's our two annual production volumes. Here's capital recovery factor on our volume, on our $5 billion investment. $1,200 a ton, clearly not competitive, even with $100 a ton carbon tax on the Western Australia ammonia. Solid state ammonia synthesis considerably less, down to 787. That's with a 15% capital